welcome back. We're going to continue on with our study of the Habakkuk Peshare. We are, uh, this is part two. And so we'll go ahead and just jump right back into it. So uh, we left off the, uh, they were, the author of the Peshare is relating the uh, description of the Chaldeans, the Babylonians, during the first temple time that Habakkuk wrote about, they're comparing them to the uh, Katim or the Romans uh, here in the first century AD. Uh, like I've said before, I believe that this Peshir was probably written in the first half of the uh, 60s common era, so sometime between 62 and 65 common era. Um, and so uh, talking about the, the people who keep his commandments only when convenient I believe that's the first century Pharisees um, and so I'm trying to see where we left off okay I think it was here why do you stare O traitors now we know who the traitors are the traitors are the men that align themselves with Paul um, the, the man of lying and they remain silent when the wicked is swallowed one more righteous than he the one the righteous one of course is the teacher of righteousness or James the wicked um, would probably be um, Ananus the wicked priest his interpretation concerns the house of Absalom and the men of their council who were silent at the time of the chastisement of the righteous teacher and did not aid him against the man of lying who rejected the Torah in the midst of their assembly. Okay, so um, they're interpreting this about the traitors. They're, they're giving us some details here. Okay, the, the house of Absalom. So who is Absalom? Well, Absalom was David's son who turned against David and, and led a mutiny against him. Um, so Absalom, of course, was a member of David's own house. So he's, they're relating it to the men of their council who were silent at the time of the chastisement of the righteous teacher and did not aid him against the man of lying who rejected the Torah in the midst of their assembly. So apparently at some meeting or some assembly, I'm wondering if this is the assembly or the meeting between James and Paul that's mentioned in the book of Acts where uh, where James says to Paul, you know, have you not seen that there's myriads of people here <coughs> zealous for the Torah? That perhaps it was during this meeting, but at some point, um, apparently, the man of lying, who I believe to be Paul, rejected the Torah, so the Torah is done away with, in the midst of the assembly, and was chastising the righteous teacher, was chastising James, the brother of Yeshua. And that there were men of the assembly who remained silent at the time. So there were some members of the assembly who sided with Paul and some that sided with James. Um, and so I believe that this is what's being described here. It says, And you deal with man like the fish of the sea, like creeping things to rule over him. All of them he takes up with a fish hook, catching them in a net and collecting them in a dragnet. This is why he sacrifices to his net. This is why he rejoices and celebrates and burns incense to his dragnet, since by them his portion of fat and his eating is plenteous. His interpretation concerns the evil ones of the rulers of the Katim, who collect the riches with all their booty like the fish of the sea, and for what was said about thus sacrificing to his net and burning incense to his dragnet, its interpretation is that they sacrifice to their standards and worship their weapons of war, since it is because of them his portion is fat and is eating plenteous. This is actually described by Josephus. He talks about in the War of the Jews, the way that the Romans will put up their standards and they'll, they'll worship them and give sacrifices to them. It's something that caused a big controversy with 
the Jews because they didn't want them bringing their standards into Jerusalem. Um, and you can read about that in the writings of Josephus. So this accurately describes the Romans. It's, um, since it is because of them as portion is fat, they worship their weapons of war. Its interpretation is that they parcel out their yoke and their taxes, consuming or devouring all the peoples year by year, giving many countries over to the sword. Again, you know, you, you see that even in the New Testament writings, there's constant discussion about the taxes and the tax collectors. Um, and, and here, you know, their taxes are mentioned as, as consuming the people year after year. It says, therefore, his sword is always unsheathed to decimate the nations mercilessly. Its interpretation concerns the Katim, who destroy many by the sword. Young men, grown-ups, and old people, women, and children, they have no mercy even on the fruit of the womb. Again, you know, this is something that's mentioned by Josephus, is that when they would overthrow one of those cities during the Jewish revolt, they would just rip open the stomachs of pregnant women. They had no remorse whatsoever for killing everyone from you know the infant to the elderly man that you know couldn't even walk all of this is related in Josephus to the Katim but I will stand up upon my watchtower and take my stand upon my fortress and spy out to see what he will say to me and what I shall answer when I am reproved and Yahuwah answered and said, Write down the vision and make it plain on tablets, so that he may read it on the run. And Elohim told Habakkuk to write what was going to happen to the last generation, but he did not inform him when the age would end. And concerning what he said about reading and running, its interpretation concerns the righteous teacher to whom Elohim made known all the mysteries of the words of his service of prophets. For their shall yet be a vision of the appointed time and it will speak of the end and not lie so um so they're relating this again to the righteous teacher now the righteous teacher appeared to be james so i said earlier that i thought the the priest that was mentioned was um yeshua possibly but it's using the same language concerning the righteous teacher the righteous teacher to whom Elohim made known all the mysteries of the words of his servants and prophets. So this appears to be, actually, I guess we could go back, try to find that. Yeah, the priest in whose heart Elohim put the intelligence to interpret all the words of his servants and prophets through whom Elohim foretold what was going to happen to his people. And then that's the same thing that was said um, here. If I can find it again. <laughs> yeah. To whom Elohim may known all the mysteries of the words of his servants and prophets. So this, I guess the righteous teacher is also that priest that's being described. So, um, you know, I, and I see this now. We have further evidence that kind of narrows stuff down. Um, so, and again, this kind of supports what else was said earlier about it was the the man of lying came in and attacked the righteous teacher, um, chastised him in the midst of the assembly, and then it's also connecting the the man of lying to the wicked priest, whom I believe to be Ananus, which also kind of lines up with my theory that when Josephus de is describing in, in chapter 9 of book 19 of um, Saulus seemed to be connected to Ananus, that Ananus was using Saulus as like a, um, a thug to go in and steal the ties of the poor priest. Now it almost seems like here that the uh, the the man of lying is also a agent of or closely aligned with the wicked priest. <clears throat> um, for there shall be yet a vision of the appointed time, and it will speak of the end and not lie. Now, 
the uh, its interpretation is that the last era will be extended and shall exceed all the prophets have foretold since the mysteries of Elohim are are astonishing. Um, now this is interesting. So the author of this Pesher is interpreting that the last era will be extended and shall exceed all that the prophets had foretold. So in a lot of the, the writings that we see in the New Testament, it appears, and, and even a lot of the writings that, um, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, that they were expecting the end times to come very quickly. That they, you know, that they were not, they didn't appear to be foreseeing another 2,000 years. Um, the one exception, I think, would be um, Kepha writing about the, the two days, is it, you know, the, a day is a, is a thousand years and a thousand years as a day. And on the third day, he will raise us up. So that would appear that Kepha was expecting 2,000 more years and in the third millennium after his day, that's when um, Yeshua would return. So, of course, you know, now we're, we're on the verge of crossing over, you know, at the end of 2,000 years from the death of Yeshua, we're approaching that date. We're probably 14 years away from it right now. Um. But Robert Eisman is connecting this belief with the delay of the parousia uh, that you see in Christian theology. It says, if it tarries, wait for it, for it will surely come and not delay. Its interpretation concerns the men of truth, the doers of the Torah, whose hand will not slacken from the service of truth. Again, doers of Torah is a, it's a phrase used by James. And I think that Paul also mentions um, being a doer of the Torah. So this is a phrase from the uh, New Testament that now we see showing up in these Dead Sea Scrolls. And doers, a uh, do in Hebrews, ose. So doers, oseans, or Essenes. Uh, so a scene itself may come from this phrase of being a doer. Uh, there's also a group written about by Epiphanius of these early Jewish Christian groups that called themselves the Oseans, or the doers, um, whose hand will not slacken from the service of truth, through the final, though the final age be prolonged before them, because all the heirs of Elohim will come to their appointed end as he's determined them in the mysteries of his intelligence. Behold, his soul is puffed up and not upright within him. Its interpretation is that their sins will be doubled upon them, and they will not be pleased with their judgment. And the righteous shall live by his faith. Of course, this is the, uh, the phrase that Paul always reverses, and it, it changes to the righteous shall live by faith not live by his faith or his faithfulness, which is what it actually says in Habakkuk. Um, this interpretation concerns all the doers of the Torah in the house of Judah, whose El whom Elohim will save from the house of judgment because of their works and their faith, or their faith in the righteous teacher. So again, you see this doers of Torah... Um, whom Elohim will say because of their faith in the righteous teacher. There's also a theory, I guess this is a good place to mention that, that the, the righteous teacher would have just been a position within the assembly. And so, like, um, John the Baptist would have been the righteous teacher for a period, and then he would have passed that mantle on to Yeshua, and then Yeshua would have been the righteous teacher. Um, or, you know, you see... You know, somebody comes to Yeshua at one point and says, you know, it calls him good teacher. And so maybe that's an allusion to this whole, like, righteous teacher, the teacher of righteousness. And so then at, at Yeshua's death, and that would pass on to James. And so then James because, became the teacher of righteousness. And then at the death of, of James, and it passed on to Simon Bar Cleopas, and he became the, the, the teacher of righteousness. So that's another theory that has been um, put forth. 
<clears throat> and furthermore, the arrogant man is betrayed by riches which cannot comfort, but rather he opens his mortal soul as to hell and like death cannot be satisfied. But rather all the nations are gathered to him <clears throat> and the people collected unto him. Do they not all satirize him and make up sayings against him? And they say, Woe to the man who multiplies unto himself that which is not his. How long will he continue to burden himself with debt? His interpretation concerns the wicked priest who at the beginning of his office was called by the name of truth, but when he ruled in Israel, his heart became puffed up and he deserted Elohim and betrayed the laws for the sake of riches. And he stole and collected the riches of the men of violence who rebelled against Elohim. And he took the riches of the peoples, heaping up to himself guilty sinfulness, and he acted in the ways of abominations of all unclean pollution. So, again, this now you're talking about the wicked priest again, who is Ananus. Um, you know, Josephus seems to describe his father, Ananus, as being a righteous man. And so then Ananus, Ben Ananus, starts off you know, on a good path. He's got a good, upright father, but then he gets in. And what do we see? Josephus talks about how he would use this, these men of violence to go and plunder the people. Is, is similar to what's being said here. And then his heart was puffed up when he ruled over Israel. Remember I mentioned that there was that period of time where Ananus ben Ananus found himself to be the ranking person in Judea. And he took advantage of that and used that opportunity to uh, to, to kill James. So I, I think it could be you know describing this that same scenario. Um, took the riches of the people, heaping himself guilty sinfulness, acting in the ways of abomination of all unclean pollution. Will not suddenly your torturers arrive and your tormentors awake? You will be their spoil since you spoil many nations, and the remainder of the people will plunder you. Its interpretation concerns the priest, or the high priest, who rebelled and broke the laws of Elohim, they afflicted him with judgment upon evil and afflicted upon him the outrages of evil pollutions in taking vengeance upon the flesh of his corpse. Um, as for the words, since you spoiled... Me. Okay, so this, this little footnote here, not the redundant body of his flesh. In a lot of the translations, it'll say body of his flesh instead of the flesh of his corpse. And so Robert Eisenman is saying that's not an accurate translation. What it's literally saying here is that they will take vengeance upon the flesh of his corpse, which is exactly what happened to Ananus ben Ananus, according to Josephus in Wars of the Jews. When Ananus was killed by the Sicarii, they abused his, his dead body and threw it over the walls of the temple. I mentioned that earlier. Um, as for the words, since you spoil many nations, all the additional ones of the peoples will plunder you. Its interpretation concerns the last priests of Jerusalem who gathered riches and profiteered from the spoils of the people. The last priests of Jerusalem would have included Ananus. <clears throat> but in the last days, their riches together with their booty will be given over to the hand of the army of the Katim because they are the additional ones of the people. Yetzar ha amin. Yeter ha amin. Because of the blood of men and the violence done to the land, the township, and all its inhabitants, inter interpretation concerns the wicked priest, whom, as a consequence of the evil he did to the righteous teacher and the men of his council, Elohim delivered to the hand of his enemies to afflict him with torturing and to consume with bitterness of soul because he condemned his elect. So they're interpreting this to say that Ananus ben Ananus was um, given over to his enemies and murdered and his body abused and thrown over the wall because he condemned uh, Yahuwah's elect which, of course, would be James in this instance. Woe to the profiteers profiteering 
evil into his house who places his nest high up to escape the power of evil you have devised shame for your house by cutting cutting off many peoples and sin against your soul for the stones will shout from the walls and the beams of wood will answer it the interpretation of the passage concerns the priest who his stones will be for the oppression and his beams of wood for stealing okay concerns the interpretation of the passage concerns the priest who his stone will be for oppression and his beams of wood for stealing Oh, I, I see what happened here. So, this portion of this column was destroyed. And so then when you get to the top of the next column, column 10, it's, it's starting over on a new subject. Um, its stone will be for oppression and its beams of wood for stealing. And concerning what it says, cutting off many peoples and the sins of your soul, its interpretation concerns the house of judgment, which Elohim will deliver in rendering his judgment in the midst of many people. He will arraign them or lead them there and condemn him in their midst and judge him with fire and brimstone. Woe unto him who builds a city on blood and establishes a township on unrighteousness. Behold, does this not come from the Lord of hosts that the peoples labor for the sake of fire and the peoples tire themselves out for the sake of nothingness? The interpretation of this passage is about the uh, spouter of lies who leads many astray in order to build a worthless city upon blood and erect an assembly upon lying. So um, this 19 and 20, let's go look that up real quick. We got the footnotes at the very end here. Okay, so I thought this was would be a Robert Eisman talks about this building a city upon blood and relates it back to Paul who um, talks about being a master builder, and so this seems to be kind of playing into what what Paul said, where he's talking about uh, this master builder of this new faith that he's rolling out and um, the response from the uh, scenes is is that they're talking about um, the spouter of lie who lies who leads many astray in order to build a worthless city upon blood and erect an assembly upon lying so you know Paul the emphasis on blood, the blood of Yeshua, a lot of that came from the Pauline epistles. And so the, many scholars have noticed that when the apostles write about the redemptive act of Yeshua, <clears throat> for them, the sign of the redemption was not the death of Yeshua, but it was his resurrection. Whereas Paul seems to to write about the death of Yeshua is what brought redemption. And so, you know, it was the blood of Yeshua that made atonement. Now, the Essenes rejected blood sacrifices. So Paul's doctrine was diametrically opposite to their doctrine. And so Paul's the one building this worthless city upon blood and erecting an assembly upon lying. For the sake of his glory, tiring out many with a worthless service, and instructing them in works of lying, so that their uh, works will be of emptiness, or count for nothing, and they will be brought to the same judgment of fire, with which they insulted and vilified the elect of Elohim. So they they didn't believe in in Paul's faith only doctrine they believe that your faith had to be backed up with works <clears throat> for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of Yahuwah like waters covering the sea the interpretation of this passage is that in their return to Elohim the spouter of lying and afterwards 
this knowledge. Oh, and so, so then, um, you know, there's the bottom of this column was lost. So then we're back to kind of a new subject of lying. And afterwards, this knowledge, like the waters of the sea, will be abundantly revealed to them. So again, you see this connection with waters and lying. Um, and so I believe that the, the serpent that spews out water after the woman in the book of Revelation, I, I believe that that is a reference to Paul in his lying waters that he spews out. Woe to the one who causes his neighbor to drink, pouring out his fury unto drunkenness in order to look upon their festivals. As says in the received Habakkuk, this is look upon their private parts. Its interpretation concerns the wicked priest who pursued after the righteous teacher to swallow him in his hot anger in his house of exile or exiled house and at the completion of the festival of rest of the day of atonements he appeared to them to swallow them causing them to stumble on the fast day the sabbath of their rest <clears throat> so there's several things that go on here um it appears that the righteous teacher was taken by the wicked priest on the day of atonement but the way this is worded here it looks like that the the righteous teacher was keeping a different day of atonement than the wicked priest and so the wicked priest took advantage of that fact and came in and, and took the righteous teacher to be uh, to be tried in the house of exile now, at this time, the Sanhedrin was actually in a, a separate house. And so the, um, the house that they, the, the, the room of hewn stone that the um, Sanhedrin was supposed to meet in, in the temple complex, they couldn't meet in it because of the, the earthquake had damaged the room. And so the the Sanhedrin were exiled into another house. And a lot of times when you read commentary about this, they they believe that the the, the priest, the righteous um, the teacher of righteousness was the one that was in the exiled house. But it may be that the exiled house was where the, the trial was held. It says, uh, You are satiated uh, more with shame than glory, drink, and also stagger. Uh, I, well, actually, before we move on, it's interesting that it does appear that there was a different fast day being kept, a different day of atonement, which is something we see in the Essenes keeping the solar calendar versus the you know, uh, religious establishment in Jerusalem keeping a lunar calendar. This is further evidence for Yeshua's followers being on the solar calendar, the Enochian-style uh, Qumran calendar. Um, it says, For the cup of the right hand of the Lord play, um, will come around to you, and shame shall cover your glory. Its interpretation concerns the high priest whose shame was greater than his glory because he did not circumcise the foreskin of his heart um, and walked in the way of satiety, satiety in the way of drinking his fill. But the cup of the wrath of Elohim will swallow him, adding to his shame and disgrace and the pain because of the violence of Lebanon shall overwhelm you and the destruction of dumb beasts. Okay shall terrify you. So this is the rest of the line from Habakkuk. Because of the man of blood, or the man of, uh, oh, the blood of Adam, shall terrify you because of the blood of Adam and the violence to the land, the township, and its inhabitants. Um, so, the um, a lot of commentaries will will try to say that they think that 
the the wicked priest had a drinking problem and so that's what this cup this drinking is phil is about um but doc no, professor eisman i think gets this right that it is actually the the cup of the wrath it's not because he's a drunkard it's because he's going to drink the cup of uh, the wrath of elhim because of what he's done <clears throat> says the interpretation of this passage concerns the wicked priest he will pay the be paid the reward which he rewarded the poor the ebionim because lebanon is the council of the community and the dumb beasts are the simple ones of judah doing the torah um just as he conspired to destroy the poor so too elohim will judge him to destruction and as to the same because of the blood of the township and the violence of the land his interpretation is the township is jerusalem where the wicked priest committed his works of abominations polluting the temple of elohim the violence of the land relates to the cities of judah where he stole the sustenance of the poor um, again this is what we see here you know the wicked priest um, stealing from the poor priest you know he was stealing the tithes and it caused people to die from want of food same thing that's being uh, described here where um, the wicked priest is stealing the substance uh, of the poor sustenance of the poor of what use are graven images whose markers formed a casting and images of lying in whom the craftsman put his trust when he creates dumb idols? The interpretation of this passage concerns all the idols of the nation, uh, nations when they create in order to serve and bow down to them. These will not save them on the day of judgment. Um, woe to anyone saying to pieces of wood awake and to dumb stone arise. This can guide... Behold, it is covered with gold and silver, and there is no spirit at all within it, but the Lord is in his holy temple. Be silent before him, all the world. His interpretation concerns the nations who, shall, who serve stone and wood, but on the day of judgment, Elohim will destroy all the service of idols and the evil ones uh, from off the earth. Okay, so that's the end of the Habakkuk Peshare. Um, so as you can see there there is a lot of connections that can be made with um, Paul being this uh, spouter of lies and the wicked priest being uh, an anus been an anus and in fact I think you can make even a better case that an anus been an anus is a wicked priest uh, but then when you put it together with Josephus then it's pretty easy to see that, again, the, the spout of lies or solace, Saul, Paul, is, um, is, is, again, connected to this wicked priest. So I pray this has been a blessing to you. I thank you for listening. Um, thank you and shalom.